I went and I, I had with me a photograph of the house. And even though I knew that it didn't exist anymore, I felt really sad when I got to it and, and I saw this big shiny block of apartments that was there instead. Um, and I just felt really sad for Max's mum, even though it wasn't her house. She'd never lived there. Hello everyone, my name is Thea Daracott and I am the Acting Executive Retail Editor and Events Director for Condé Nast Traveller. Some of you will already be familiar with our Live Traveller's Tales series which we run in London. While well, during this period of lockdown, we're hosting them as a series of recorded Zoom calls and I'm now joined by Claire McIntosh. Claire is a British award-winning author and former police officer. Her novels are published in more than 35 languages and have sold more than 2 million copies worldwide. The paperback version of her novel, After the End, has just been released. Claire, thank you so much for joining me. Um, so obviously there is so much to discuss about After the End, but we're going to stick to a slight travel um, angle. But first I thought it might be helpful for the viewers if you could summarise the plot without giving too much away. Of course, I'd love to. So After the End is a novel about two parents who have a really strong relationship but they disagree over the end of life care for their critically ill son. Um, so obviously a really emotional issue um, and it's a story about what happens when you have to make these life-defining decisions and how you deal with the consequences, what it does to your relationship and how you start to build a new normal going forward. Perfect. Um, and part of the novel is based in Chicago. And I wanted to start by asking you how you decide where to put your novels. Well, so normally the story tends to inform the location. So, for example, the, the novel that I'd written previously, Let Me Lie, um, is essentially about um, suicide. It's a psychological thriller uh, um, around the theme of, of people who have taken their own lives. Uh, and that's set in Beachy Head in the UK, which was a, a very, very sort of obvious place to, um, to set the story. So sometimes it's to do with the plot. I'm really embarrassed to admit that actually the reason After the End is set in Chicago um, is purely accidental. So when I started thinking about the story, I, I had no idea that the actual story was going to move outside of, of the UK. So I knew that I wanted one of my characters to be American and there are various reasons that sort of have parallels with the story and, and the great divide that that opens up between these these two characters Pip and Max so I knew that Max was going to be American he could have come from anywhere and the only thing that I knew from the outset was that he wouldn't be from New York and that's purely because I'm slightly allergic to um, novels that are set in capital cities or in, you know, they're, they're, they're in um, places that have just been overused. So in uh, with British novels, it's London or it's Glasgow um, and, you know, so many New York based novels. So I just wanted a, a city that represented the fact that here was a character who could be from anywhere. And so I chose Chicago. And had you ever been there yourself? No, never been to Chicago. Um, and as I said at the time, I didn't expect to actually have to write any action in Chicago. It was just a throwaway, you know, backstory. That's, that's where he was from. What happened in the course of writing the first draft was that the, the story developed in such a way that it took Max back to Chicago. And so suddenly I had almost half a novel that was set in a place that I'd never been. So then of course you had to research it. Um, how far into the novel were you? Is it, is it hard for you to stop writing and then go and research a place? Does it disrupt the flow or do you continue writing whilst you're on your travels? A little bit of both. So actually what I did was I made a conscious decision to finish the first draft before I physically went to Chicago. And there are a couple of reasons for that. One, as you very astutely pointed out, it, it can interrupt the, the flow. Um, but also I 
I tend to throw away quite a lot of words between my first and second draft. And if I'd finished my first draft and then I'd send it to my editor and my editor had said, I really love it, but I'm, I'm just not sure Chicago is the right place, you know, or I'm not sure we need to see quite so much of it. Then I would have done a lot of research, taken a lot of time, spent a lot of money and it would have been wasted. So instead what I did was, um, I, I wrote the first draft and when I got to the end of the first draft, I then knew what was staying, what was going. I also had a really clear idea about what I needed to research because it's quite easy to go to a place and, and get a, a feel for it. But in, until you know exactly what you're looking for, it's much, it's much more difficult to get those specifics. So what I did during the first draft was I, um, I did my research online. So I identified where people lived. Um, I was particularly keen to find the street where um, Max ends up staying. He, in fact, he, he, he lives with his mother for a short time. So I wanted to find Max's mum's house. And I was very clear in my head about the way this house looked. Um, but I, I try very hard not to use real addresses in my novels because I think it's uncomfortable for people who live in those places. Um, so I found online an article about a house that was going to be torn down um, and replaced with condos and all up and down this street, they, they'd taken down the, the old um, houses with the porch and you know the veranda and the, uh, the steps up to the door and the basement and they'd built condos all, all up and down the streets. But this one house still remained and there was a big campaign online to save it. And I knew that this house ultimately had been torn down and replaced with condos. Um, so I could use it because that address no longer existed. So I had this photograph of the house and for the first draft of the novel, I'd had that up on my board. Um, and then I did go to Chicago um, and it meant that I could go and, and visit that house. So it was still standing? Well, no, so I visited the plot and it was really bizarre because um, I went and I, I had with me a photograph of the house. And even though I knew that it didn't exist anymore, I felt really sad when I got to it and, and I saw this big shiny block of apartments that was there instead. Um, and I just felt really sad for Max's mum, even though it wasn't her house. She'd never lived there. Um, you know, I'd lived with these characters for almost a year by that point. Um, and uh, I, I went to the bar at the end of the road where Max um, goes and, and ha has a drink sometimes. And I had a beer there um, and sat in the garden where a, scene's the, where a scene is, um, takes place in, in the novel. And so I really... I did all the things that my characters had done. And because I'd researched it online first, I, I had a really clear idea about what they looked like. But what that level of research does is it enables you to understand what it feels like. And that brings a richness to your descriptive writing that I think it's impossible to get without physically going there. So how long did you spend in Chicago? five glorious days um <laughs> and i uh you know that there's there's very little i think better than being to take being able to take a legitimately tax deductible uh research trip um, i'm not going to call it a holiday because my accountant um, might hear um so but it really was it was genuinely a research trip i had lots and lots of work to do it's just that 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 work for me in that particular uh, scenario involves lots of eating and drinking and walking and sightseeing and listening to people's conversations, listening to the cadence of their accents and the things they're talking about, um, looking at the clothes they're wearing, how they interact with people in, in stores, all those sorts of little details. Um, so I was there for five days. And because one of my other characters, so, so Max is married to Pip. Pip, as you know, is, uh, is cabin crew. And although actually we don't see her working as, as cabin crew in, in the present day, it's very much part of her backstory. And so I felt it was, uh, I was entirely justified in 
flying business class because that's what she did for a living. So how could I possibly understand her character if I didn't do it? <laughs> I think that sounds like a very wise decision. Um, it's tough, it's really tough. Um, I also wanted to ask you about Chicago. You'd obviously researched it well and included it already in your first draft. When you went there, did anything change for you? Did anything surprise you about it? it so it didn't surprise me exactly, but I had definitely not captured some, some details. So for example, the, the L, which is the, the elevated um, train track that, that goes around Chicago, um, above your head, above the roads. I just couldn't picture it. I, you know, I, I'd read about it in, in lots of books. And when I started writing, I went back to some of those books. So um, The Time Traveller's Wife, for example, is set in Chicago. And so I reread that and I kept reading about the L and I knew in principle what it was. But I don't think we have anything like that in, in the UK. And I just couldn't get my head around what it would feel like to travel on it um, and to walk around and have it passing. And so uh, that was really, really useful to get the real, the, the sense of the noise and the feeling of being on it. And then I wanted to also speak to you about Pip, who obviously is cabin crew. How do you research something like that? Obviously you, you undertook this, this journey. And <laughs> this arduous <laughs> journey. Yeah, more like, all in the name of research. Um, <laughs> how, do you, how do you get, into a, a role like that of, of cabin crew, having not experienced it yourself? Do you, how do you reach out to them and find out what it's like? There, are, there is no shortage of cabin crew happy to talk about their jobs. Also, I discovered that they're, they're incredibly indiscreet on forums. So there are no end of aviation message boards that you can just, just dip into and read all their stories and they ask each other questions about particular aeroplanes and you know some of them are training to be cabin crew so they're asking loads of questions about what they should do and what the protocol is and sharing standard operating procedures and all sorts of things that there really is a wealth um, online but I also had a, a couple of, um, uh, of readers of mine who have been cabin crew and so they were really helpful an ex-colleague of mine I used to be a police officer and when she retired from the police, she went and joined um, Virgin as cabin crew. So I spoke to her about a couple of things. So um, that was that was really good. And and my you know my job as a novelist is to put myself in the shoes of different characters. Um, and it's it's huge fun because I think there are lots of us would like to do lots of different jobs and you don't generally get the opportunity to have more than perhaps two or three careers at most. So as a novelist, we get to have those careers by proxy. And I really enjoyed being cabin crew. Um, and I also wanted to ask you, because you obviously you write from three different viewpoints throughout the novel. Um, and I wanted to know if you ever develop a favorite. Do you find one character means more to you than the others? That's a little bit like asking me to choose between my children, <laughs> obviously. Um, yes they do they do um and in other books i'm i've become very very fond of particular characters um uh, i've got a retired detective called murray who i adore and um, he and his wife sarah I'm, I'm very very fond of them um in after the end i found it really hard because the very essence of the novel is to split the reader in two, to, to, to feel so torn between what Max wants to do for his son and what Pip wants to do, that they themselves can't necessarily decide, you know, their sympathies should waver between the two. And so because of that, when I was writing, my, my sympathies were very much um, moving between the two of them. The third character, Layla, actually, um, again, much like Chicago, was never supposed to be in the novel. And then um, evolved over the course of it uh, and and I really enjoyed researching her character so sadly I didn't get to travel with it but I traveled through food and language because she's um, Iranian 
And so I worked with a, a Persian teacher and we went out to a Persian restaurant in Manchester and ate everything on the menu and talked about culture and um, the, 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 the way the landscape looked and how that differed to where Leila was now working as a doctor in, in Birmingham. So I became very, very fond of, of her. Um, and uh, it, it's, a funny, it's a funny thing because you live with these characters for a year or so when you're writing and then perhaps a year or so as you promote these novels and talk about them. So they, they really do become part of my rather odd extended family. Do you ever find yourself, um, when you start writing another novel, do you ever find those characters slipping into your next novel by mistake, just as a Freudian slip, you know, referencing their names or something? Yes, actually, that's such a good question. I've never been asked it before, but yes. And I, I find it in lots of different ways. I find it um, firstly in that the world that they were in has, um, get, has sparked ideas for other things. So for example, the fact that Pip was cabin crew and I started looking into the world of, of cabin crew and aviation. And as a result of that, I'm now writing a completely different book, a psychological thriller that takes place entirely on a, an ultra long haul flight. Um, and the central character is, is cabin crew uh, again. Um, and it was very, very tempting to then slip in people that Pip had worked with or perhaps Pip herself and I, and I don't do it and I don't do it mainly because particularly with the novels that, that I write which are about extraordinary things happening to ordinary people actually to give somebody more than one extraordinary thing in their lifetime I think is a bit harsh and the very point of these novels is that we're seeing them at a moment of extreme stress where the worst thing in their life has ever happened. Well, how awful for Pip to, to survive this terrible experience that she's been through with, with her son and her husband, only to then be thrown into a thriller set on a, a long haul flight to Australia. It seems a little unfair. Um, and so you've, you've just finished. Can I ask you a little bit about your next novel, obviously? Um, when, firstly, when is it due to be published? It'll come out next summer, so summer 2020. And how... Have you... No, what are we now? We're 2020 now, aren't we? 2021. 2021, it'll come out. Um, I think the summer's a write-off anyway, it doesn't really count. Um, <laughs> so I just wanted to ask you, how do you go about researching that? Because obviously, again, it is cabin crew and set on an airplane and, and, and you can't fly, but you're polishing your final draft do you, how, how did you um, go about colouring it in, I suppose? Well, so that's been really hard, actually. Um, and I have, I had not appreciated just how much writing I do when I travel. So I, I travel a, a lot. I'm, I'm away probably for about a third of my, my year is spent um, either abroad or in other parts of the UK. So I spend a lot of time in, uh, on trains and in planes and in hotel rooms, and I work so well. I, I think probably the, my most productive environment is in an airport lounge. Um, and uh, and I, have a, I sort of play a game with myself, I'm quite harsh. I say that I, I, can, I can pay for a lounge, um, a business lounge, or I can upgrade my train ticket if I write. A, a thousand words and if I'm not prepared to do that I told you I'm really harsh I'm a terrible <laughs> boss and if I'm not prepared to do that then you know I don't get to sit in a nice place and and have uh, uh, lots of buffet food and, and glasses of champagne so I'm very very strict with myself but it's it's a real incentive so I work really really well with that kind of buzz of activity around me no one can interrupt me um, and I've struggled with that um, and, and yeah, the, the, the traveling. So I wrote the first draft of this book quite a long time ago, about um, eight months ago, while I was still traveling. And then the second draft, uh, I, I think the last flight I took was back from Dubai in February. So I'd been to Dubai for the Emirates Literature Festival. And when I was going out there, I was writing and I can't, I won't talk about any spoilers, but I was writing a particularly tense 
scene set on an aeroplane, which may or may not have included some kind of um, suspicion of uh, a bomb. Okay, so I'm writing this scene. I'm sitting in um, in the business class cabin of my lovely um, Emirates flight with my champagne, writing this scene before we took off. Um, and then they they sent out a security announcement to say that we all had to leave the plane. And I, just for a moment, I was terrified that I had something I'd written had been seen or, you know, and I had jeopardized this entire flight. Anyway, fortunately it wasn't anything to do with that. But I did spend that flight writing all those scenes that, that I particularly wanted to get the atmosphere from and looking at the distance between seats and the shape of the cabin and the, and the way things feel and the, that peculiar distortion of sound that you get on an aeroplane when there's always that low level white noise. So you can't actually hear people's conversations. And, um, so yeah, it's, fortunately I, I'd got most of the book finished before lockdown started and who knows when I'll step on a plane again. Hopefully soon. Um, but I want, I also wanted to ask you about with, with COVID-19, whether or not that that's affecting the way you, your novel now, because it's set on an airplane. We don't know if there will be things like social distancing. Are you just going to predate it before this all began or are you going to I, it? Yeah. So I've been a bit worried about this actually, because you're absolutely right. There are lots of things in this book that will will change if you know that could change um w w as a result of COVID-19 I made the decision to undate it so I, I generally am quite fluid about dates anyway because I don't want my novels to, to to date particularly quickly um but I made a conscious effort to go back through this draft in fact I've done it in the last two weeks and take out any reference to any date at all so I'm, I'm calling that undating. Uh, I'm not, I don't want to put it necessarily in a pre-COVID world. I certainly don't want to think about what a post-COVID world looks like. It's all a bit depressing. So I'm undating it. And um, hopefully by the time it comes out, it will all be fine. <laughs> we'll be back in the air again. Um, yeah. I also wanted to ask you about, in After the End, social media has quite a uh, pivotal role I would say within it do you think social media has a, is it has a positive influence on the whole or are you on the fence in in life in general gosh it's hard isn't it I think there is there's so much toxicity um online I I love social media I really do and and a lot of my a lot of the support that I've had in life I've found online. So years and years ago, when I was struggling to conceive and then later going through fertility treatment, the support from that, that world, that online world of other parents going through what I was going through was just incredible. And I'm still in touch and very close friends with uh, several of the women that I met on, on those forums. Um, and, and now the, the same sort of support that I get from, from the author world on, on Twitter and Facebook is, it's really great to, to feel connected, but it is, it's a huge time suck. And I also, I'm, I think I'm quite receptive to, to mood. And so I've learned already that if I start my day scrolling through Twitter, that that will determine my mood for the day. And that's a, a pretty horrific way to live one's life I, I think and and if it's happening for me it's probably happening for many many other people as well so I do think that we've got to keep a lid on it a little bit and one final question I think um during during obviously this period of lockdown a lot of people have started writing their first novel and I was wondering if you have any tips for aspirational novelists that's a big question. Um, we could we could do an entire session all about tips for aspiring writers. Um, the, I mean, the, the biggest the biggest most sensible tip is is to finish it. You know, it's very easy to start a novel, but actually, it's um, it's finishing it that's difficult. And I suspect that a lot of the people who have 
for a long time said, oh, if only I had the time to write a novel, are now finding that actually it's not just time that you need to write a novel. You, you, you need a few other things as well. Um, I think, uh, so a really practical tip that I discovered when I was working as a police officer and my writing time was much more fragmented. I couldn't sit down every day to write and I might have five days or two weeks between each writing session. So um, what I did was I stopped every writing session in the middle of a scene. So rather than, rather than give in to the instinct of sort of neatly getting to the end of a chapter and being able to tick off, I've written a whole chapter today. And then looking at a blank page the next time I sat down, I would stop in the middle of, of action, in the middle of a paragraph, a sentence even, which meant that when I sat at my writing desk, I was plunged straight into the action. And that meant I was much more productive and, and could you know, get, get straight into the writing of it. So I think that's quite useful for anyone who is fitting writing around other things like you know, working from home or homeschooling or all the other challenges that we've got at the moment. But the main thing is just, Get it written because until you've written that terrible first draft and they're all terrible you can't edit and that's where the magic happens and the trips to chicago absolutely yeah <laughs> well thank you so much for your time claire oh it's a pleasure so lovely to talk to you thank you thank you